we have a chat with author Bill DeSmet about his new book, Dualism, on The Sci-Fi Show. Thank you for joining us on the Sci-Fi Show today, Bill DeSmet. Thank you for having me, Jason. So, you've just written a new book, Dualism, which is the second in the Archon series, following on from your debut novel, Singularity. So why don't we start with, why don't you tell us a bit about what Dualism is about? I've read it, I really enjoyed it, but what were you hoping, what, uh, what's the story you were hoping to tell? Or at least enough not to spoil it. <laughs> Well, when when I think about it thematically, it's about artificial intelligence, collective consciousness, and the NSA. Sort of lions and tigers and bears, oh my! <laughs> it does it does have that feel to it, and I I must say I really enjoyed it. It was a it was a good tale with lots of interesting uh, interesting ideas, which is my favorite sort of writing. I'm a big fan of Robert J. Sawyer and I'd put you in the same category as him, which hopefully you well, consider high praise. It's intended I, as such. I, <laughs> I, I very much enjoyed his Calculating God. Oh, yes, I enjoyed That's one of my favorites of his. Anyway, we're here to talk about you, not him. So <laughs> <laughs> so this is the second in the, in, the, in the Archon series. It's got some characters from the original Singularity. Another, another uh, great tale involving black holes, the KGB, and the end of the world, you don't pick I... subtle topics. <laughs> well, it's not a real thriller unless it, the, the world is, is uh, in jeopardy. That's, that's true, I suppose. It's not, it's not very thrilling watching a character get a hangnail treated. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did you come to write Dualism? What, what was the motivation for wanting to write a story about the NSA consciousness and artificial intelligence? Well, there were a couple of drivers. On the one hand, when I, when I finished Singularity, it occurred to me I had these two characters that, that seemed to be converging on a relationship, and I wasn't really sure how possible that is in the modern age, whether couplehood is, is even a possibility. Uh, so I wanted to explore that more and, and perhaps throw up some challenges to it uh, and, and see how that would work out. On the other hand, I've had a long wrestle with the notion that, how do I phrase this, that uh, physical causality essentially rules out any sort of separate mode of existence for the mental as opposed to the physical. And I tried to address that as best I could in the, in the book as well, but actually to explore a number of, of different possibilities for, for how the mental might uh, coexist with or subsist under the uh, natural physical world. So that, that was a motivation as well. And then I had Going in, I, I basically had two scenes that one of them was, was drawn from earlier work I, I had done uh, quite, quite a bit earlier, and the other was, was one that I just visualized. I wanted to see if I couldn't connect them in, in some fashion, and uh, dualism is the result. So that's how you came to write it. Now, the story focuses on the question of an artificial intelligence. Do you have any background in that sort of thing, or what do you think are the prospects for actually making artificially intelligent agents of one sort or another? What would that even look like? Have we already managed to do it, I guess, is possibly the other question. In terms of uh, IBM's Watson or things of that nature? Well, well, in a, well yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in a small way, I, I do, in fact, construct such agents. They're not, to my mind, truly art artificially intelligent. Uh, they're just good language handlers. They're, they're conversational agents rather than intelligent agents per se. But 
it does give me a sense of their limitations and what it would look like to go beyond them. So in dualism, there's actually a chapter called Witness where my one of my protagonists, Jonathan Knox, encounters essentially a conversational agent, a machine that is skilled at handling language, but doesn't really have a sense of self-awareness. The lights are on, but there's nobody home in this particular robot, which is a uh, is in the shape of a, a guard dog and patrols the premises of the estate on which much of the action takes place. So I wanted to counterpose that to what I thought a real artificial intelligence Real artificial is rather a strange oxymoron, isn't it? I was, was going to say that. It's a strange turn of phrase. Um. <laughs> but we know what I'm talking about, I hope. But what what it would look like if we, if we actually achieved the goals of the artificial intelligence program, what what it would be like to converse with a an entity like that. Okay. I suppose it's artificial in the sense of constructed artifact as opposed to or manufactured as opposed to pretend or substitute. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Actually, yeah, I did like that conversation with the guard dog. I thought it was uh it, it illustrated the idea really well and it was it was entertaining to boot. So you you oh, have great. you you have a knack taking an interesting and or taking an interesting idea or a complicated idea and uh, making a story around it that explains it well. So I, I appreciate yeah. your saying that very much because I had I had to go to the mat with my editor on that scene and a couple of, of subsequent ones as to whether uh, they could be made dramatic enough to, to engage a, a general readership. Oh. You're not a general reader. I don't, I don't know editor. if I count as a general but, reader. Or no, no I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so. You, Obviously, you're looking for specific things when when you address a novel. But I but I enjoyed I enjoyed the scene. I thought it was I thought it was quite entertaining. It was certainly funny. So <laughs> okay. I, so I thought I, I thought it illustrated the difficulty with humor really really well. So I had a chuckle on the train when I was reading it. So <laughs> terrific. If it, as long as it was intended to be funny, I haven't missed the point. No, no, not at all. So the real artificial intelligence is built on top of some sort of quantum computer in the novel, uh, as opposed to, I assume, the guard dogs are just, well, I don't know, um, fancy PCs, I guess, by comparison, yeah. that sort of classical uh, von Neumann machine. Mm -hmm. Yes, just a functional approach to AI. Do you think something like that is a requirement to build an AI, and why? Um, well... That's a big question, obviously, and it's quite speculative. So, <laughs> it it is, um, and uh, although I don't really go into this much in the novel itself, um, there is a whole school of thought um, led by Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff, I believe, first name is Stuart, proposing that, well, it it goes back to something. Penrose wrote in Shadows of the Mind, where he he proposed that because humans could appreciate the truth of uh, propositions created by Kurt Gödel um, and known as Gödel's proof of undecidability, but machines could not. That that in itself indicated there was there was something beyond the merely mechanical reasoning that a, a, a standard AI is capable of. And when Roger came up with that, he went looking for a mechanism, and he, he sort of felt that it needed to be involved with quantum mechanics in some way, shape, or form, because over and above quantum mechanics, all you really have is mechanism in terms of the operation of nature's laws. And when he linked up with Hameroff, uh, who had been doing work on quantum entanglement in the microtubules that, that make up the uh, scaffolding of neurons, um, it, it seemed that they may have had a, so to speak, a match between Roger's theory and, and Hameroff's research. Very recently, just last year, there's been some confirmatory evidence. Uh, I should point out that when that theory first came out, which was known as ORC-OR for 
orchestrated objective reduction. Um, it was attacked by, among others, Max Tegmark, as Max himself reminds us in his most recent book on mathematical universe, because it was impossible for, for quantum effects to survive in a living brain, which was described as a wet, warm, noisy environment. <laughs> but that was in 1993, and uh, in the new millennium, we found any number of quantum effects persisting in wet, warm, noisy environments like avian navigation. It's, it's apparently how birds sense the uh, magnetic field of the Earth and are able to orient themselves on it, or photosynthesis for that matter. And just last year, some research was report, reported indicating that the same may be going on in uh, the neurons of the brain. So uh, altogether, it seemed as if there, when we do solve the problem, quantum mechanics is going to be implicated in some way, shape, or form. I guess the question might be better phrased not why does a, why does quantum mechanics need to factor into it, although I think you might be right there, but why can't uh, an, an ordinary von Neumann machine like a PC uh, achieve artificial intelligence? That would be the flip side of the coin. You're looking to something like quantum mechanics because it would seem that sort of classical computing is incapable of the task. Right, I, and I'm not adamant about it being quantum mechanics, but as to why you, you could not achieve artificial intelligence using a classical computer, uh, I'm not sure that you couldn't in the sense of uh, someone like David Chalmers in his um, uh, search for a fundamental theory of, of consciousness. Uh, he posits the notion of zombies, which are not like the zombies that you see on, on television, but it's a philosophical concept that just refers to some entity that is, to all exterior appearances, totally the equivalent of a given human being. Uh, the difference is that they have no inner life. All that you have in there is, is mechanism. Again, the lights are on, but, but there's nobody home. And my thought is that with a functionalist, a purely functionalist, mechanistic approach to artificial intelligence, uh, a zombie is probably as far as you're going to get. And the artificial intelligence in uh, my novel, Dualism, who calls himself Nietzsche for reasons that I confess I don't even quite understand. <laughs> uh, seriously, Nietzsche professes to be self-aware. And uh, that's, that's something that I don't think uh, we're going to achieve just by proceeding along the, either the symbolic AI or the sub-symbolic AI routes at the moment. I, th I think there's something we're missing if, if that's all we have in our arsenal. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you. I guess the problem is how can you tell if another agent of some sort has an internal life? Um, all you can do is ask them. <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, yes, uh, but um, it's of course been pointed out that, that that's not only a problem when we try to determine whether there's self-consciousness in a machine. It, it, it's more general than that. It's the problem of, quote, other minds. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, this is, this is it, isn't it? How do I know? How do I know you're not a zombie, um, or the sort of philosophical zombie? I can only really take your word for it. Exactly, and and uh, as as Nietzsche points out to Jonathan Knox, Knox is willing to grant the uh, the other people that he encounters the benefit of the doubt because they look like him and react like him, but he's not willing to grant it to a machine. And I I, I suspect there isn't a really good test for the presence or absence of consciousness. I've I've seen a few. Uh, hints that there, there there might be some physiological aspects that, that would enable us to tell the difference, which would, of course, uh, undermine Chalmers' zombie hypothesis, if it were, in fact, possible to hook up some electrodes and determine, well, yes, this person's conscious. Uh, it, it is interesting in that regard that uh, Stuart Hameroff, that I was speaking of before with respect to, uh, to the ORC-OR theory, his expertise is actually in anesthesiology. Anesthesiologists 
get very interested in, in the problem of consciousness because it's their job to take it away. So they kind of need to be sure that they've done that successfully before the surgeon shows up with a scalpel. So the challenge you've got with an AI is how, how do you tell it's not just Searle's Chinese room? Uh, at the end of the day, if you can talk to it and it'll give you it'll give you appropriate answers. I suppose, actually, the philosopher Peter Kreef, he touched on the idea of artificial intelligence and why he was sceptical of it. And um, the one unique thing that humans can do that an AI, it would seem, isn't capable of doing is questioning its programming. And of course, you could say, well, you could program an AI to question its programming. That's true, but you couldn't program it to question the programming that questions its programming Whereas humans are capable of doing that, maybe that's maybe that's a test for consciousness after all. I don't know. <laughs> I thought it was an interesting observation that. Yeah, it's a, it's a question of being able to to step back and achieve a a different level, a certain perspective on our own thought processes. Kind of self-referential in a way. I I haven't really read a whole lot of Kreeft. Um, basically, just his his work on Tolkien and. Things of that nature. You have an interesting scene where characters get their consciousness transferred. Well, one, a, a couple of your living characters have their consciousness transferred, and there's an interesting scene. I don't think this is a spoiler, where while their consciousness is being transferred, but before it's been sort of restarted on the machine hardware, um, they're aware of some experience. But at least on the assumption that uh, your consciousness requires it requires to be sort of instantiated on some hardware and running, this should be impossible. I thought that was an interesting idea. Uh, were you sort of hinting at the trying to hint at the idea of a soul there or something? I guess apart from having a brain, silicon or otherwise. Yeah, you're you're, you're very astute, Jason, <laughs> because. Uh... That is, in fact, what I was hinting at, or at least I wanted to raise that as a possibility. There's, there's uh, um, nothing in the situation that would, would force that interpretation, but it's there for anyone who wants to pick up on it. Okay, I thought that was a really natural interpretation of it, but okay, <laughs> that's just me. Okay, what I, or one of the things I thought was interesting, um, you were talking, uh, in, in the book, you're talking about um, Nietzsche being a, a conscious or... Uh, being conscious, uh, being, I suppose, alive is the word we want to use. I was reminded of, oh, I come back to this one a lot, the Reality Dysfunction series by Peter F. Hamilton. Okay. Uh, in the story, basically, uh, it's the tale of how humans discover they have souls and an afterlife of some sort. And there's a lot more to it than that. But it's this interesting idea that you develop a soul that will persist after death once you reach a certain level of complexity in the mind, sort of the mind, it's almost like, I guess it's a, I guess it's a form of neutral monism, but uh, you have a, a, another plane of reality that sort of is parallel with ours or something. I'm just trying to think how to explain it. And as you get a more complex mind, it, uh, it's sort of parallel there. And you end up with a soul that runs, a, well, you know, to be alive, you need to sort of, be running in both of these and when you and when your body dies if the mind is sufficiently complex it will continue to survive in this other realm something like that it, it sounds very much like uh, Plato in, uh, reminded of the Phaedo which is the, uh, Socrates death, death scene where he talks about philosophy as being necessary to strengthen the flames of the soul so that it can persist after death yeah so I've always found it a really fascinating idea and it got me thinking in your book, assuming a soul, uh, assuming assuming you have a soul in some in in the sense of some consciousness that can survive death. The question is, does Nietzsche have a soul? The robots don't, or the the, the guard dogs don't. They don't have an inner life. But uh, Nietzsche, the quantum computer, maybe he has a soul after all. Maybe any uh, maybe any actually conscious AI would have a soul by virtue of being well. You know, to to have consciousness requires having a soul, and I guess you could take the point of view, therefore a machine could never be conscious. But perhaps the reverse is true, <laughs> and that machines that achieve consciousness get souls at that point, or like, well, in in something like that sense that Plato and Hamilton were talking about, where 
consciousness requires a soul and the soul emerges at a certain level of complexity. I thought it was an interesting idea. I was sort of, I wonder what happens if you turn Nietzsche off. That was what I was left thinking and then turn him back on five minutes later. Well, maybe that's what happens to us every night. Maybe that's what dreaming is, yes. I'm, I'm not sure that requires complexity on the order of, of a human consciousness to, to qualify for, uh, I guess, soulhood. Our little dog, who's been running around here during the uh, uh, the conversation, certainly seems to me to to have enough of, of personality and intention and uh, and lovingness that uh, I'd be willing to uh, to vote for her having a soul. Yes. Oh, I'd I'd, I'd certainly agree with you. From interacting with uh, the two cats and the two dogs we own, they certainly have. Uh, they certainly seem, it, it would be surprising if they didn't have some sort of soulish inner life, as it were. But I guess, was it Aristotle said, um, the soul is the form of the body. So uh, any, anything that's alive has a soul. And I guess, at least in terms of what we're talking about, we probably mean something slightly more specific in the sense of a rational soul or a soul able to reason. Although... I don't know. My dogs and cats can be pretty smart and cunning and devious and stubborn and all of the sorts of things you'd associate with human beings. They don't do abstract thought very well, but they certainly do stubborn and petulant and everything else exceptionally well when they want to. Actually, I, I wrote a blog for Huffington Post, yes, it was in January of this year, called My Dog, the Knowledge Engineer, where I, I tried to cite certain instances that through observation would appear to impute a certain level of abstract reasoning on on the part of the the dogs I've observed under certain circumstances. Their ability to, um, well, in in the one case, uh, we had a sort of a, a step stool that looked like a flight of stairs that was placed butt up against the uh, island in our kitchen where we were preparing some meat that uh, was was very very interested in, and so she jumped on what she thought was a stair and. And as she did, instead of it, it sitting stable like a stair should, it lurched under her. And she backed off, and she looked at the stair, and then she looked at me, and I could, I could almost smell the rubber burning as she tried to cogitate this, uh, because I think what, what, she was, what she was thinking about was that this did not fit the model that she had, the prototype for a stair. Don't move. I've seen that sort of behavior too. I, I guess maybe they don't do abstract reasoning in the same way. Like you, I, I think you might struggle to teach dogs and cats mathematics, but they certainly, or oh, like abstract <laughs> mathematics, but they, they certainly seem capable of reasoning and problem solving. Well, you'd have to struggle to teach me mathematics too. Well, you know, <laughs> there is that. And they certainly know how to sort of communicate their wishes and wants. Uh, even if most of those wishes and wants are scratch my belly and give me something to eat now, and I want to walk. <laughs> yes. Speaking of uh, mathematical faculties, I, I don't know if you've been following it all. There's, there's a story breaking. Or I, I guess it's, it's been making the rounds for a while, but uh, there's a new pu book published on it. Uh, the story of Jason Paget, who was assaulted and uh, beaten ferociously about the head uh, outside of a karaoke bar in 2002, and he recovered and, and uh, had a certain amount of um, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder and, and other difficulties. But what it seems to have done is uh, kicked in some previously underutilized area of his brain, and he became to all intents and purposes and is still a mathematical genius. And you can go on the web and, and find some of the illustrations that, that he's created of the way he sees the world. It's sort of like synesthesia, but he, he basically, uh, he'll look at any attempt to represent a circle, and he'll tell you that's not a circle because he can see the polygons in it. He can see the the edges, whether you can or not. I do remember reading something about the story. I haven't been following it particularly closely, but that's that's fascinating. I'm not sure what it says that um, mild brain damage makes you a maths genius. Well, it's uh, it more like um, th there may be areas within the brain that uh, that we're just not using that, that don't get hooked up and 
Uh, I suspect it's something more like that, but yeah, certainly interesting. So anyway, got a, I guess what would be called a strong AI. We're also part of this, and we've looked at consciousness transfer in the story. It involves quantum teleportation in the book, but you also have uh, the NSA in the book is developing a thing they call merge, which involves grabbing a whole lot of people's consciousnesses and bringing them together and using that to solve problems. On earth did you come up with an idea like that? Do you have access to some secret government, pro- some seemingly horrific government program that we're unaware of? Well, I could tell you, but then I'd have to shoot you. Okay. As as far as I can recall, dualism went through a number of iterations, and they went the, the iterations it went through were, were basically in search of of the ultimate end of the world threat. And I, I had a few, but uh, they were too pedestrian, really. I wanted something that was really out there. And then I came across the word work of a gentleman by the name of Calvin Andrus, who uh, works for the CIA and was trying to come up with any number of ways to increase the efficiency of that organization. And one of the ways he was he was doing that was to try to adopt essentially web-based technology, things like Wikipedia and and um, news feeds and blogs and enable CIA agents to to share their experiences using those same sorts of technologies, although, of course, they'd, they'd have to be secured as opposed to the yeah. kind of wild west of, of, of the web. And I guess that got me started thinking what what would the – uh, national security apparatus here in the United States or elsewhere for that matter do if um, if they had an unlimited budget which as far as anyone can tell they probably do and and we're interested in exploring uh, these avenues they, they probably wouldn't stop at, at being able to have their own form of blogs or Wikipedia and of course the Russians did a good deal of experimentation with distant viewing and other psychic phenomena back in the in the 50s. What I'm looking for was was nothing to do with uh, parapsychology. It was it was rather a physically based effect that nonetheless enabled multiple human brains to uh, participate in a, a shared consciousness, and and that's kind of based on Crick's um, Francis Crick's notion of of uh, the binding problem in consciousness. That how is it that, that we can take essentially different clusters of neurons firing, even when you view an object, uh, you've got one cluster in the striate cortex is determining its outlines, and another is determining its color, and another is determining how it translates when it when it may move, and yet we experience all that as a unified consciousness, a unified qualia if you will. It's, it's also what got Descartes first thinking about the distinction between mind and body, because as far as he could tell, although physical objects could all be subdivided indefinitely, uh, the consciousness, the mind, appeared to be a unity. And the whole notion of the, the cogito uh, as well, about which there's a funny story. Descartes is sitting in a Parisian cafe and finishing his lunch, and the waiter comes up and says, would you like to see a dessert menu, monsieur? And Descartes says, I think not, and disappears. <laughs> Philosophical one-liners. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So I, I think the book is a great read and definitely worth picking up. We've touched on some of the themes in it. So if people wanted to get a hold of this or a hold of Singularity, what would be the best way to do that? They wanted to get a hold of Singularity. Currently, their only option is an ebook on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any, any of the other vendors, but it will be out in trade paper shortly. And Dualism itself is coming out in both hardcover, trade paper, and ebook, a trifecta, so to speak, on Tuesday, May 13th. So right next week. Okay. I'll be sure to put links to all of those in the show notes. And what can we ex- uh, what, so when can we expect the third chapter in uh, this series of books? The third book is going to be called Triploidy. 
And if, if you begin to sense a pattern in those titles, you're not wrong. And it, it has been, uh, unlike dualism, where, as I sort of alluded to, I, 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 I groped after the plot. Uh, this one is, is kind of fully formed. The, the outline is in place. I just uh, have been waiting to put dualism to bed before launching into the writing of it. And uh, it's, it's going to be, this is going to be a, a science thriller version of 24, I think. It's, it's all going to take place in 24 hours. It's going to feature what I believe to be a unique take on alien invasion. Well, you better hurry up and write it, because I'm in. <laughs> all right, there you go. <laughs> Thank sounds you. great. Well, I guess we'll see that when it comes out. I, I'm hoping 2015 sometime. Okay. Well, I'll definitely look forward to that. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you again, and it, it was a pleasure talking with you. I hope you enjoyed that chat with author Bill DeSmet. Now you can find his books linked to in the show notes over at scifishow.com, and I can be reached for feedback, feedback at scifishow.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next time. And don't forget, it's fire with a PH. The Sci-Fi Show is recorded under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 3.0 license, and the music is by Furious J and Maniacal M. The Sci-Fi Show is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Find more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to make you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Learn how to podcast, theorize over the TV shows Once Upon a Time, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Under the Dome. Laugh with our clean comedy, interface Christianity with the world, learn critical thinking from movie reviews, and more at noodle.mx.